Hello again, Internet, and welcome back to TV Coast to Coast, a semi-regular gathering of critics stationed all over the country. We have Mark Dewidziak in Cleveland, chiming in this time. We have Vicki Hyman in New Jersey, chiming in this time. Uh, Christy Turnquist in Oregon has the week off. I'm Dave Walker from NOLA.com and the Times Vicki in New Orleans, uh, coming to you from a protected underground silo, uh, keeping me isolated from network publicists and my own email. We are in DV Armageddon time in our business right now. There's so much TV happening, and it's, it feels just like a torrent of stuff to write about. I've gone blind from reading lists of what you need to know about all, several different shows before you watch the show. This week, we're contributing by talking about Game of Thrones, which returns to HBO on Sunday. And um, to prepare for this chat today, I, I uh, in the silo, in, in our mess hall, I convened a panel of experts who've read the books and watched all of the series. And, and by that, I mean my son and my wife. And in trying to get a handle on what I've, I'd watched, I've seen the first four episodes of the new season. And also talk about sort of the larger story and where it stands. One key thing about this coming season, I'm told, is that this is a season in which the story and characters veer a little bit from what people know from the books. And that's pivotal, and that's a, a problem for a lot of them, because the books are as beloved as the show. I think the book people like the show, too. I mean, it's got, uh, you know, pageantry and sweep and blood and violence and sex and, and swords. And it, it, the appeal is, I think, universal. It's... Uh, it, it's an epic story and one that requires incredible dedication to follow in its intric intricacies. Uh, it would have helped if I read the books, but I don't read. I can't even be seen reading a book. I can't endorse reading. Uh, I just wouldn't. Uh, but the show is plenty for me. Now, speaking of reading and writing, uh, this is the story that comes from George R. R. Martin, who's one of my local angles in following this show. He wrote in Endymion uh, for years which is one of our Mardi Gras parades. He had made pals with some of the guys in the crew uh, here for a fan convention years and years ago. And uh, I talked to him about it at one point, and uh, I asked him if there was any any crossover at all between the Game of Thrones story and, and his uh, Mardi Gras experiences. And no, you would think so maybe, but he, he had laughed at that notion. And of course, the other uh, local angle is uh, Mikhail Hustman, who's uh, now a key player in Game of Thrones and formerly of Treme, and a New Orleans resident. So. That's my selfish, very nearsighted worldview as I'm cowering from the torrent of television that's out there. Mark, I need a wartime conciliary just to do my, just to do my email. Would, would you mind serving in that capacity? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. I, I will be your Robert Duvall. Okay. Well, why don't you start now by actually talking about television instead of my problems. And okay. Tell us what's I'll coming up on Game of Thrones. Well, this season uh, starts, we, we, they have allowed us to see the first four episodes of this fifth season, which means we have to be very, very careful about what we say and how we say it. Um, that being said, I love this show. I have actually fallen in love with this show gradually. One of the things I really, really admire about Game of Thrones is it's a better series. It keeps getting better. If you see, watch the, the first episode, remember um, the, the Shield, when the Shield started on, um, on FX, and it was kind of like the Michael Chiklis show, and there was like no other, it was like, oh, we're watching this because of that character and that guy, and then gradually the Shield got better and better with each season, and you got to see more of CCH Pounder, more of Walt Goggins, more of Jay Carnes, more of Benito Martinez. That's what happened. That's exactly the same thing that happened to Game of Thrones. In the beginning, the acting weight seemed to be on just a few people. And as the show has gone season to season, the acting has gone up, the casting has gone up, and the weight of the acting has been spread out as you've explored the various kingdoms. This is a better show than it was when it started, which is kind of a scary thought. The storytelling is more... Uh, it, 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 it's much more in control uh, than it was when it first started. So 
Uh, this is a scary show. It's kind of, and, and the, the idea that it deviates from the books is probably a good one. It's like The Walking Dead. I keep comparing this to other shows, but The Walking Dead does sort of the same thing. It sticks to the general idea of what the overall epic story is. But then if it sticks to the books 100%, it's not its own thing, number one. It's not a television show. It's just a transcription of the books. And secondly, if you do that, there are no surprises. There is just nothing waiting for you that's going to surprise you. Now, in these four episodes, we've somewhat hit the reset button. We are starting with almost every single kingdom and every single ruler in some kind of trouble with a threat growing out there. Uh, everybody's trying to sort of hold on to what power they have, and everybody's sort of facing these little threats. I love the one threat of uh, a character called the High Sparrow who is the leader of a fanatical religious group, and Jonathan Price. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Price. Do I have to say anything more or why you should watch this? They, they have upped their game again. Every time they seem to add an actor, they add somebody deliciously wonderful, like Jonathan Price is playing the High Sparrow, who is this... And, and by the end of four episodes, you still don't have him figured out, by the way. In any way, you just know he's a threat. And... On every single front, every single character is facing some kind of new challenge, a new cause, new alliances. That's what these four episodes are about. Almost all of them. It, they're somewhat deliberately paced, but deliberate does not mean slow, and it does not mean it's not riveting. It is. It draws you back into this world very, very artfully. The very first episode starts with this very mysterious stroll through the woods to a witch who is going to make a prophecy about gold and thrones. Well, of course she is. Uh, what else would she be making a prophecy about? And you're just, it's a nice stroll like through the woods and it's just luring you back, luring you back into this wonderful world. And that's exactly what these four episodes feel like. They feel like this wonderful stroll back into this wonderful landscape and this, this, this mystical world that harkens to back to history harkens back to a lot of English history, and yet is very much its own world. Uh, but I, I cannot emphasize enough that I think the scariest thing about Game of Thrones is not the dragons, it's not the bloodletting, it's not the beheadings, all of which goes with this show. It's the fact that it's getting better, and it keeps getting better, and it keeps to be getting to be a more fascinating show. Vicki, what do you think? Well, I thought it was... Um a little bit too much and a little bit not enough for me. And I've read all the books and I was I was as lost almost as Dave was. And I'm like, the sons of the harpy and who are these people? And <laughs> it actually, it took me a little while to sort of like get back into the world, even though I love this world. It was, um, you know, it's actually a little frustrating that they don't do the, what you've missed on Game of Thrones. They just do that little geographical thing. You're like, okay, we're gonna be here, here and here. Um, one of the themes of Game of Thrones um, that I love that continues to be played out is the difference between the power to conquer and the power to rule, and that um, those who are only concerned with power are not the people you necessarily want to entrust with it. And, um, you know, there's this long story that's being told over Game of Thrones as to who eventually will gain the throne of the Seven Kingdoms. Um, and. We, we, we still don't know in the books, uh, and I think actually, if I'm not mistaken, Game of Thrones, the TV series is going to end before George R.R. R. Martin ever gets his act together and finishes the books, which is actually a bit of a problem for me because I I know you want it to be a different thing, but for me, as somebody who's read the books, I want them to come together in the same way. Not really sure why. I want them to have the same ending, and I think that it's been very true, actually, up until now. Um, there may be different small differences, um, but I, I, I want them to come together in the end. So anyway, there's this long arc. And so the long arc is who's going to, who's going to take over the throne and who is best to do it. And so um, I've often tried to convince people who shy away from fantasy to, to try Game of Thrones by saying, it's like House of Cards but with dragons instead of Doug Stamper. <laughs> and I think we saw that theme this season on House of Cards very much. It's a different thing to try to govern than to conquer. And so back on Game of Thrones, we have the jockeying for the Seven Kingdoms going on, but they're also showing us um, some of the more sympathetic possible leaders. We have Daenerys and Marine. She's struggling to rule over her conquered city. 
We have John at Castle Black this season, that's all I'll say. Um, but you really see people who are trying to be leaders and not just conquerors, and that's just fascinating for me to watch. And then, of course, you have like these train wrecks like Cersei who are only concerned with power. Um, and that's probably the most interesting thing I've taken out of um, the first few episodes. Um, Dave, did you have any uh, opinions about the first four? Um, a couple. One, as I was watching, it, I was reminded a little bit of what I thought about the Mad Men premiere, which is, I don't care what happens to anyone else as long as it ends well for Peggy. <laughs> and in this show, I want it to end well for the imp. And uh, I can't tell you why. He's... Not, he's I just, he's a very sympathetic character to me, and, and, and I, I hope it ends well for him, and it ends well for the dragons, who are sort of the C-130 <laughs> gunships really? of, the, of this world, yes. Yeah. Um, but they burn little babies up. Fine. Yeah, they're looking a little snappish this season, I might add. <laughs> and they are. They're, talk about scary. Uh, but uh, I, I, uh, uh, I think through the first four, I, it is a little bit more deliberate of a storytelling than I remember, and that's fine. Uh, since I'm not uh, checking off elements from the books as I go, it's all discovery for me, and uh, I'm willing to go where the show takes me. And uh, I think that's true for a lot of viewers. And 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 you know, George R. R. Martin just announced another HBO show. I'm sure inflaming the internet with people who want him to sit down and finish those books, um, so that what what you're hoping will happen will happen. I would love for him to do that too, just so I don't have to get those emails from people who are mad about it. Well, you know, one of the things about this is um, apparently, to, to speak to Vicky's concern, um, and, and I have no special knowledge of this, by the way, but the, the word is that uh, George R. R. Martin has shared with HBO and the production team on Game of Thrones how it's going to end, what the, the key plot points are, almost somewhat conceding the point that uh, they'll get to the end before he does. That, that's almost a certainty at this point that he cannot write fast enough. We don't even know if he's going to get the next book done uh, in time. You know, he says, you know, we're hearing maybe 2016, but who knows? I mean, you know, who, who really knows? But he apparently has shared the game book um, with the Game of Thrones producers. And this is probably a necessity at this point of, you know, how, how is this going to end? And it can't end too radically different from the way the arc of the books are supposed to end. But, you know, I, and I, that's, I, 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 if there is a precedent for this, I don't know it. Um, the, the idea that you will get the answer from the TV series before you get it from the books. It doesn't seem right. There's something that seems wrong with the universe uh, when that's the case. So I agree, Vicky. It just seems like that's, there's something wrong about that uh, when this world was created on the printed page and you've been following it. Uh, and to speak to Dave's point about Mad Men, this season reminded me a lot of previous Mad Men seasons, oddly enough, is that a lot of Mad Men seasons start in this kind of very deliberately paced storytelling that uh, Matt Weiner does on Mad Men. And that somewhere about the fourth episode, the fans of Mad Men would start griping, it's off. It just seems off. It's not the, <laughs> you're not doing it. You know, it's not the Mad Men we knew and love. And then, you know, it starts to pick up speed because what was happening was, you know, he's planting seeds, guys. He's planting things and he's going to pay this off if, you know, stick with him here. And the Sopranos used to do that too, where, you know, and you get the same griping about midway through the season. And then people would say, boy, that season really came home well. Yeah, because that's the arc of the storytelling. That's what he's doing. And you get that sense with Game of Thrones this time. A lot of seeds get planted in these four episodes. And you know they're going to pay them off. You know this thing's going to explode on so many different fronts as this thing goes through its ten episodes of this season. Well, I think, uh, I think it's another great season of Game of Thrones to look forward to. It's Sunday on HBO. And uh, try to find some time. There's just, I, we know, we're sympathetic. No one knows better than we do how hard it is to keep up with uh, all the great TV that's on right now. And thank you both for taking a few time out from watching those screener discs and uh, participating today. We'll see everybody next week. And Mark and Vicki, you guys take care, all right? All right. Take care. Bye-bye.